Well, good afternoon, everybody. It's really good to be here. I um, just want to first thank um, Uncle Burmy for giving me this first opportunity to do a split sermon with all of you before the merge happens, so it should be interesting. So the title of my message is, There's a Time for Everything. What gives your life meaning? Is it your job, your family, your spouse, your work, your children, your faith? The author of Ecclesiastes was looking for meaning in life. And why I originally chose Ecclesiastes 3 before I even moved down here was because there was just a lot of change happening in my life. And the first scripture that I thought of was in chapter 1 of Ecclesiastes. And, it, and in verse 14 of chapter 1, the author says, I have seen all things that are done under the sun. All of them are meaningless, a chasing after the wind. And that was probably one of the first scriptures that I remember learning from Ecclesiastes. And I'll admit, it was kind of depressing that that was the only scripture that I learned. And that was the only thing that I could relate to what was going on in my life because with all that change happening, I had to reevaluate where my true meaning comes from. And one of the things that I thought about as I was going through the change of going from a youth pastor to intern to being a pastoral resident was it just hearkened memories of when I was in college. So when I was in college from 2009 to 2013, went to UC Davis. I majored in a bachelor's degree in psychology. And for four years, for four straight years, all I knew was how to be a good student. And in the midst of my busyness, I eventually found myself parched, thirsty, and spiritually dry. I was also in a toxic relationship at the time. And I was trying to use my business, my schoolwork, to be an excuse for escaping, for getting away from having to deal with my emotional turmoil at that time. And so keeping busy helped me. It, I, at first I thought it gave me purpose. At first I thought it gave me meaning. But eventually in my junior year, I had lost that, that drivenness and I forgot how to rest. In our, Western, in our Western culture, we live in a culture that idolizes movement. You have to have a job in order to seem of economic value to our society. Keeping yourself occupied to seem productive. We even have slogans uh, like Nike. It says, just do it. It's all about doing. And that's what, kind of what I was focusing on in college was do, do, do. And my full-time job was a student, and that's who I am. But what, what about when all that's taken away from me? What's left? Who am I? So I was kind of going through this identity crisis. And during this transition of going from uh, not a student to youth pastor intern, from youth pastor intern to pastoral resident, I, I was just asking God, who am I? Apart from my job. Not that there's anything wrong with having a job. <laughs> I mean, it gave us the gift of money to be able to provide for each other and care for our family and friends. There's nothing wrong with being productive. After all, our God created, produced, and He's a dynamic God. He's the same God of love yesterday, today, and forever. And yet his spirit is still moving, just as the spirit was hovering over the waters before creation began. But what happens when all our busyness becomes a way of escaping our sense of emptiness and insignificance? Because all my busyness in college was my way of escaping. That would be my sense of emptiness and insignificance, of not knowing, of forgetting who I am as a child of God. Why do you think when we overwork ourselves, we kind of feel like we need a vacation? 
Vacation and work, vacation and work. Well, really, the root of the word vacation is vacate. We want to escape from that which is keeping us in bondage, especially if we're not enjoying the work that we have. We want to vacate. We want to escape. We want to find refuge. We want to rest. In Jason Mraz's song, Everything is Sound, he says, we don't need a vacation when there's nothing to escape from. And so, and I'll admit, even some of the work that I did as a youth pastor intern, and even now as a Grace Communion Seminary student, sometimes when I'm going through an emotional roller coaster, I will use that busyness, I will use my schoolwork, my own job, as a means of escaping some reason of insignificance in me that is not true. Something that the enemy is trying to put into my heart, put into my mind, but really that's a false reality. We can even do work for God, even be too busy for God to truly know Him. We can even be very busy for God and still not know Him. Because being born into WCG, World Wide Church of God, I knew about God my whole entire life. But it wasn't until recently that I really started knowing Him. Just like knowing a friend, wanting to know, truly know your spouse. And I found it ironic that as much, as good as I am of listening to people, I found it hard to listen to my own God. Because as close to me as my next breath. And so I was immersed in what I did that I only knew myself in relation to it. Well, what if all of that is taken from me? What if my health is taken from me? Kind of like Job, my health, my family, my friends, my work. What if everything that seems to give my life significance and meaning is stripped away from me? For a season or forever? Who am I? Who am I? Apart from all that I know in this world. Or as the author of Ecclesiastes says, Who am I apart from this world under the sun? It's questions like these that the writer of Ecclesiastes wrestled with, even though he happened to be the wisest man in the world. He wrestled with these, and these are questions of who am I? Is there more to it all than just this? These are questions as ancient as the fall and as contemporary as the seven o'clock evening news. In Ecclesiastes chapter three, Ecclesiastes chapter three, it's interesting that the writer goes from everything is the same, all toil, all work is meaningless, to switching it up in chapter 3, saying that there's actually, even though everything's the same, there's also a time for everything. There's a time for change. And so I'm going to read the first eight verses of chapter 3. He says, There is a time for everything, and a season for every activity, under the sun, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones and a time to gather them, a time to embrace and a time to refrain, a time to search and a time to give up, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to mend, a time to be silent and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. There's one specific word that this author of Ecclesiastes just keeps on saying, and what is it? Time. Time. The writer talks about time, and yet makes a significant shift from the first eight scriptures of that of this book of, of this chapter 
And in starting in verse 9, he goes from talking about things in this world limited to time and space, things under the sun only, time. What is the opposite of time? Something that is not of time or space. Something not of only under the sun, but something that is eternal. And that's why I think this, this writer, this wise man was trying to get at, that there is something more to just this time here that we have. That you are more, your identity is based on something that's beyond this world, under the sun. And so in verse 9 he goes on to say, what does the worker gain from his toil? What's the, what's the point of all my work here? He says, I have seen the burden God has laid on men. And then he says one of the most amazing things. He goes from talking about time to talking about eternity. He says, he, God, has made everything beautiful in its time. Not everything in this world is bad. For when he created, he said it is good. So yes, thing, there are things beautiful in our times. But God has also set, what? Eternity in the hearts of men. Yet we cannot fathom what our God has done from beginning to end. He says, I know that there is nothing better for men than to be happy, to know who we are eternally, and do good while we live during our time here on earth. That everyone may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all our work. This is the gift of God. To find satisfaction in our work. And our work is to do His will, which is the same will that He gave Jesus. I know that everything God does will endure forever. Nothing can be added to it and nothing taken from it. God does it so that men will revere him, so that we can worship him, just like how Regina was just talking about earlier. And so we are not limited to this world under the sun that's limited of, of just time and space. We belong to a world beyond that. We're from a world that is eternal. And the eternal is actually here and now. Behold, the kingdom of God is in your midst. And so the writer of Ecclesiastes is making a huge contrast here. In the first 14 chapters, uh, in the first 14 verses of chapter 3, he's making a huge, huge contrast between that which is temporal and that which is eternal. In the, tem in the temporal world, things are temporary, limited between time and space, temporal. Things that are only seen out of the sun. But let's look at these words again. Script, um, the verses 1 through 8. A time to do all of these things. What are all, what are all these words? If you ever took English grammar, what, what type of words would they be? They're verbs. They're things that you do. A time to be born, and a time to die, a time to love, and a time to hate. It's all doing. There are, there's a time to do things under the sun. But I think in contrasting that with eternity, I think the author is also trying to say that if there's a time to do, then there's also a time to be. To be and rest and know who you are as a child of God, as his beloved a time to set aside, to simply be, a time that is anointed to just be with God, the God that is always moving and dynamic, and yet the God that is always the same yesterday, today, and forever. The other day I went, um, I went jogging, and thankfully I, where I live in Pasadena, I live right next to the mountains right by JPL, and it was just gorgeous. Earlier, I mentioned that our Western culture is so used to moving, moving fast. You're always doing something, whether it's in the car, you're on an airplane, you're doing work, we're always kind of obsessed with, with doing things all the time. 
And it fascinated me that even you are surrounded by the presence of God, by his creation. You are in the woods, and his sun, the beautiful sun, is, is peering through the trees. The wind is blowing in your face. And yet I noticed that people still would not notice that. People are, are running, they're biking, they're walking their dog. People are even in, in the surrounding environment of God's presence still miss him, even as he's right there. And so what I chose to do was just stop. I stopped, and there was a particular spot where it was just something about the way that the light shone through the trees, the way the tree looked. It was something ancient and yet so present at the same time. And I just stood there. And I just breathed. I listened to the leaves rustling and everything seemed to be as if they were on cue. As if there's a director that's directing the symphony in front of my eyes and that I'm hearing at the same time. I heard a woodpecker to my right, to my left, and on my right I felt the breeze into my going by my shoulder and it was something beyond this world to just be present and just be with my God. I felt like eternity was coming into the present and it was beautiful. Yet how many of us actually take the time to stop and just be with our God and rest in Him? For we can rest even as we are working, even as we are doing His will. Jesus was resting and doing God's work all the time. Because He said, I came to do my Father's will. And He was always one with Him, communicating with Him through intimate relationship with the Holy Spirit. And so I experienced eternity in the present, and that was a gift, I know, that God gave me. In silence and stillness, I rested. I was reminded of what Paul tells us in his third letter to the church of Philippi, Philippians 3, 20 to 21. He says, he basically explains why we want to live forever, why we want to live happily ever after. Why? Because Paul tells us your citizenship is in heaven. You come from a heavenly realm that is beyond this world, that is beyond the things of time and space under the sun. And we, as children of God, as those who are royalty, we are royalty. We are all princesses and princes daughters and sons of the one true king. We eagerly await a savior that from there the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, everything under his sovereignty, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. He's constantly transforming us to be more like him. And what Paul means here he simply means that what will happen matters more than what has happened. For so long, I, I used to be just bound and chained by my past, by the pain that, by the sin that was done upon me, and the pain that was inflicted upon me that I forgot who I was as a complete person already, that I didn't. As beautiful as these things that I have in this world, that I am complete already as a child of God. And I don't need anything or anyone else to prove that. But you can't fully appreciate it without resting and being still. And so it was in the midst of that stillness in the woods, I realized all the pain from my past and my present didn't matter anymore. I just putting things in an eternal perspective and just like what Paul says in Colossians 3, setting your mind on things above and not on things of this earth, that didn't really matter anymore. Because my identity and your identity 
is grounded in not what is temporary, not what is temporal, but your identity is grounded in what is eternal. And so in closing, Psalm 19 is just so beautiful. David here tells us that God's always speaking to us. He says in verses 1 through 4 of Psalm 19 that the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies, I mean, just look at the clouds today. The skies proclaim the work of his hands, his good work. Day after day, they pour out speech. Night after night, they display knowledge to the stars. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their voice, God's voice, goes into all the earth, their words to the end of the world. And so in rest, silence, stillness, in simply being with our God instead of being obsessed about doing, in being with him, we can experience the eternal coming into the present. He declares to us the eternal meaning of our temporal existence. God is always speaking to you. Are you listening?